Hello, my name is Hugo Peralta Ramirez, and this is my presentation for Dr. Bond's History 101 Honors class, uh, Fact or Fiction, Guatemala and the United Fruit Company. Uh, Dr. Bond's honors course had a theme, which was food and world history. And as a Latin American historian, I chose to study the bananas, specifically looking at Guatemala. So I combined my knowledge as a Latin American historian as a, and as a Spanish literature double major by examining the literature around the United Fruit Company and how it authentically manifested itself in Guatemala, specifically with its development. In short, my research question was, to what extent is Latin American visual arts and literature surrounding the United Fruit Company's latifundio systems, infrastructure, and plantation life true when looking at Guatemala before and potentially after the 1954 coup? Uh, so my thesis was, it is no doubt that literature is a fallacious representation of life, but so too is an incomplete colonial account. By employing a post-colonial framework on the literature of Latin America with respect to the United Fruit Company's operations in the Caribbean basin, neo-colonial history can be better understood with both themes and micro examples illustrated with the literature. Uh, before I move on, I feel I must explain the methodology methodology that I use when conducting my research and coming to my creative conclusion. Magical realism in literature is a genre where essentially the magical seems normal and the normal seems magical, where technology is referred to as magic and magic is referred to as the natural order. Uh, in history and in Latin American uh, uh, culture and literature, it is an approach to looking at post-colonialism by looking at things from the point of view of the conquered peoples, rather than accepting the standard narrative uh, of the colonizer. That can, dis that can, despite the best of intentions to, with, uh, scrut to be scrutinized, can still carry many flaws and biases. Uh, the two books I will specifically be looking at will be The Green Pope by Miguel Angel Asturias, uh, and, Guatemala and, uh, and 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Before I move on, I want to establish a few quick definitions here. Puerto Barrios was the main port city of, this, of, the, Carib of the Southern Caribbean coast of Guatemala. Uh, when I referred to the land reform enacted by President Jacobo Arbenz, uh, the president who was overthrown by the CIA pictured here, uh, I'm referring to Decree 900, that is the uh, the land reform. Uh, uh, La Frutera or El Pulpo were the Spanish nicknames that were given to the United Fruit Company uh, by, the, uh, by the inhabitants of the region. Uh, the term Banana Republic refers to a Latin American nation with an unstable government and which has fruits or other cash crops as their main economic base. Uh, bananaization is a term coined by Eduardo Galeano in his 1971 book, The Open Veins of Latin America which analyzes the colonial and neo-colonial history of the continent. And the term refers to the how and why and what led to the establishment of the Banana Republic. Uh, the specific ramifications of the process, processes uh, is what I will get into uh, right now. So let's quickly begin with some context to the United Fruit Company. What became known as the conglomerate of, the United, Fruit, of United Fruit began in 1870 with a small company called Boston Fruit, um, of course, the cultivation of bananas at the time was still informal and small, um, and especially limited to the Caribbean islands. Around the same time in Honduras, a miner Keith, uh, a nephew of, of, the wealthy, of a wealthy American family and, and a colonist, uh, was working on building railroads uh, through Costa Rica. It was in 1899 when the two titans uh, of the Caribbean basin united their forces. Um, so big cash crop agriculture meets big industry, and, and the rest is history. Here, the common unit. Here, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in both the literature and the history of Latin America, the theme of importing U.S. progress, uh, civilization, development is prominent. In in these two extracts of Miguel Ángel Asturias's novel, The Green Pope, you have two sides of the same coin in Guatemala, on the aims of development. Uh, with one character saying that the fruit will generate wealth, build industrial cities uh, with all the benefits of technology, telegrams, transportation, communication, etc. Uh, while the other says that the railroads and ports are not meant to be philanthropic efforts from La Frutera and that they are, could care less about the welfare of the native populations. 
uh, arguably the most emblematic symbol of the exploitation and operations of the United Fruit Company in Guatemala under the pretense of development is the railroad. The railroad in Marquez's novel is seen as an extra extraordinary item governed by magic, not human ingenuity, and the villagers of the fabled uh, Latin American town created with rapture, saying that it will bring them wealth, connect them to civilization, and overall, overall be a net positive. In real life, however, that is not so. Uh, the, the railroad in the novel was built by a character named Mr. Brown, and as another historian noted, Mr. Brown's southern heritage, duplicitous tactics, and use of paramilitaries uh, paralleled the actions of the banana tycoon Samuel Zamuri. Zamuri had originally had his own company, a banana enterprise, but joined the United Fruit after a series of price wars at the beginning of the Great Depression. In Asturias's Green Pope, the building of the Guatemalan Railroad is undertaken by a character from the industrial Northeast, a reference to Minor Cooper Keith. Uh, again, the railroad was, was the, the glue for, for all the ventures, uh, as the evident, as the literature, both nonfiction and nonfiction shows. Uh, these maps are taken from Schlesinger and Kinzer's uh, Bitter Fruit and one from the two and one from 2001 from the University of Texas are of particular interest to me because they really serve to illustrate the size of the uh, latifundio system. Uh, we have a pretty detailed map of the country with this special note of the rivers and mountains. And of co course, don't forget that Guatemala being in Central America is very tropical and has dense rainforests as well as old Maya ruins in them. So with all of this in mind, the geography would of course be naturally uh, difficult to maneuver. The map on, uh, uh, sh shows the railroads and it was the railroads that connected the nation or the latifundio. You can see that up in the Atlantic coast of Guatemala lies Puerto Barrios, again, the only Caribbean Atlantic port that Mirafruit Fruit had at the time. And the railroad that ends at Puerto Barrios connects directly to the other major provinces and their capitals and down to the Southern Pacific port city of San Jose. Uh, I do not think it is completely possible to fathom the size of the neo-colonial system that La Frutera established in Guatemala. In his book, uh, Las Venas Abiertas de América Latina, the Paraguayan journalist Eduardo Galeano referred to the logistics and scale of El Purpo's operations in Latin America as a latifundio system, a structure that takes back to both the colonization of the New World and uh, by Spain and Rome's uh, plantation operations in the Mediterranean. Uh, Galeano also notes with, that the pillar of this system included the ships, um, factories, railroads, and banks. Uh, with respect to factories, Galeano refers to the original historical term of the word uh, factories, which were fortified trading outposts that specialized in slavery or other lucrative goods. So, of course, the factories produced the bananas uh, violently. The railroads connected the plantations or factories. Uh, the ships brought the bananas to the global market. And of course, the whole operation was financed by banks, as well as investment uh, on the free market. A key economic principle that is also worth noting that keeping in mind is that bananas or any cash crops for that matter are extremely sensitive to market fluctuations and other externalities, including nature. And with the basis of Guatemala's economy being cash crop, the United Fruit Company and the dictatorships uh, who worked with the United Fruit Company put the nation at a disadvantage on the global market. Uh, the number one thing that the images in the past two slides and, and in this slide really capture is the sheer size of the Frutera Latifundio system uh, that con it consisted of. Uh, in the black and white photographs by Cornel Capa, the railroad again is, is shown emphasizing its importance. And also in those primary sources, vast plantation lands are, are also evident, stretching as far as the eye or lens in this case could see uh, and capture. Uh, this map shows the importance of the global trade network that El Pulpo established in bringing bananas from Latin America and the Caribbean, primarily on and from the Atlantic ports to Europe and the United States. Again, uh, this was a, neo, uh, a global neocolonial model. Uh, of course, this was one side of imperialism, uh, and that was in more of an economic approach. Uh, at the time, uh, another form is is a cultural imperialism. At the time, of course, the liberal ideas of progress uh, and civilization carried racial undertones. In Guatemala, the racist attitudes of Americans developed primarily because many of its prominent officials were uh, American Southerners. Uh, so to, and to build the latifundio system, 
uh, coercion was used and needed. Specifically, the violence with mercenaries uh, was utilized in a way to, in a way needed to maintain the system. By the same token, uh, there was a strong spirit of the Jim Crow South, uh, American South, which manifested itself in segregated company towns between American officials and United Fruit Company workers, uh, Guatemalan laborers. In the literature, this is also evident with this, with the uh, excerpts from Garcia Marquez that talks about the inequalities in the construction of the houses and the qualities of the houses and the juxtaposition of wealth with the American neighborhoods being more developed and the native neighborhoods being underdeveloped. One thing that is noteworthy is that the United Fruit Company uh, renovated that company, uh, the town, company towns renovated by the United by the United Fruit Company did include schools, stores, hospitals. Uh, nonetheless, they lacked funding or, or adequate developed world standards. Uh, I believe it's it's right, it's safe to say that the United Fruit Company is not remembered for its humanitarian endeavor, and, and rightly so. A good historian, however, should take note of every objectionably good and bad thing surrounding his studies and research. It's actually quite curious to note that the New York Times and Los Angeles Times back in the first third of the 20th century, Laurel did the United Fruit Company for its work of civilizing and developing Guatemala. In fact, the United Fruit Company even protected and at times uh, restored or conserved the ancient Maya ruins that it encountered when clearing jungle uh, and for, for plantations uh, and developing railroads. Uh, Sam Zamuri was also an avid patron of Tulane University uh, located in New Orleans, uh, funded by his banana wealth. Uh, these actions, of course, were, were optics, either born out of an imperialist psychite of the period uh, or, or United Fruits of publicity campaigns. It is also worth mentioning that although Cornell Kappa, the, the activist photographer whose images I have used throughout this presentation, may have been staged or, or, or handled by the United Fruit Company for the sake of its own public image. So when it comes to the images, Take them with a grain of salt as they may not show the true brutality of the latifundio system. One last thing that is also worth noting is that uh, on the ground, the popularity of the United Fruit Company's leaders was true among some Guatemalans. These, of course, were wealthier Guatemalans. And in Guatemala, since the Spanish first arrived, wealth and social class uh, and, and race are arguably still connected to, to, uh, to ancestry. In essence, the better off descendants of the Spanish settlers. As I said earlier, uh, using a post-colonial lens to view the history of the voiceless or the conquered against the voice of the victor can give us a more complete image. With that in mind, it's also worth examining the standard narrative uh, of Guatemala that was. With the end of the decade of democracy in Guatemala, uh, under Arbenz's liberal reform administration via the US-backed coup, the U.S. and United Fruit Company did try to underplay and misconstrue the reality of the Arbenz administration and the operations of the U.S. and United Fruit in Guatemala. The U.S. did falsify media reports on Arbenz to make him look like a communist and did censor a lot of the CIA records. And of course, United Fruit uh, would later go on to rebrand itself to Chiquita Banana to wash its hands of, of Guatemala. Even before and after the era of liberal reforms, United Fruit would also undermine its workers with legislation under the dictatorships that they collaborated with. It was within this context, however, that Garcia Marquez did publish his novel, granted many years after the events had happened. And Asturias did witness most of these happenings, both under the pre arbenz dictatorship that cozied up to the United Fruit Company and the issues during and after Arbenz's dictatorship. Uh, um, or Benz's his government, with the United Fruit's involvement and the dictatorships, which he does chronicle first in the Green Book and later in short stories such as A Weekend in Guatemala. Uh, with the United Fruit Company's coup against Arbenz, the installation of a military junta in Guatemala, uh, uh, the military understandably took control of the nation. Under the dictatorships, the junta and the military launched an indiscriminate campaign repressing the poor workers and activists in the countryside, many of which were of Maya heritage. This did evolve to become the Mayan genocide of Guatemalan civil war. Again, uh, the United Fruit Company distanced itself from the event, rebranding itself into Chiquita Banana and relinquishing control of the latifundio system that it had developed. As Eduardo Galeano noted also, United Fruit shifted its model from 
holding all the lands in developing the country to contracting independent farms, which put all the stress on the native producers because of the costs and environmental risks, as well as competition. This economic vacuum, no jobs for unskilled laborers, underdeveloped industries, as well as weak government initiatives, such as education and rapid crime, has fostered conditions for mass migration, uh, noted in a podcast interview by the Harvard Business Review. This residue of the banana company's exit is also illustrated in the final chapter of Garcia Marquez's novel. Uh, overall, I leave you with these conclusions. Examining post-colonial history via literature in the absence of a record, in this case due to poor, undereducated, and censored labors, can be a useful tool to revise a colonial narrative, uh, in this case, that of the United Fruit and the CIA. Also, today's humanitarian issues in Guatemala uh, is the U.S.'s responsibility to remedy, but it, be it as a domestic affair at the border or constructive diplomacy. Uh, moreover, it's important to recognize these shortcomings, and although there are certain nuances, like Samuel Zamari being a bootstrapping immigrant, La Frutera providing uh, uh, political stability and economic pros prosperity relatively, um, but, but the means were violent and unequal, so the short-term costs and benefits don't outweigh the human and political long-term sufferings. Uh, these are, this is my bibliography. Uh, thank you for your time.